So indeed, the idea today is to present a recent work that we put online on archive. This is the archive number. Uh, titled Understanding Quantum Machine Learning Also Requires Rethinking Generalization. And as you can imagine, this is not work done in isolation, but uh, in a nice collaboration with Jan Seiser, who you may, may already know, and Elias Gilfuste, who is a PhD student in Jan Seiser Group. Okay, so this is the outline of the talk, so that you know what awaits you. So first, I will do uh, an introduction. Uh, here, perhaps, I will invest more time than what's it's usual, because I would like to set the right uh, mindset and common grounds for what's the context of this work in, in the literature. Then I will start with something I've called the pitch, which for me is like the most important part of this talk. So here I will define the problem and give the results in just a few words, so in the most non-technical way possible. And then for those interested in the details and what's under the hood, I will talk about uniform generalization bounds and how we can say something about these bounds with randomization tests and memorization. And then the conclusion and final remarks. Okay, so the introduction. So there are a bunch of things that can be called uh, quantum machine learning. So I want to be clear about what we call quantum machine learning in this work. So machine learning is at the interplay of some model, some data task, and some uh, training algorithm that tries to look for a good hypothesis to fit the data. So in, uh, if you want to talk about quantum machine learning, at least one of these things has to be quantum, right? And in particular, we consider two things being quantum. First, the model. So we are going to talk about parametrized quantum circuits as learning models. And then data. We are going to consider uh, quantum data as inputs of our parametrized quantum circuits. Then we are going to stick to a classical training algorithm like the SGD or Adam or whatever. So this is the statement we start from. Parametrized quantum circuits are promising for quantum machine learning in the near term. Yeah? Um, following up on um, Bethan's talk, so when you say quantum data, uh -huh. do you mean data of obtained from quantum experiments, but yeah. classical yeah. stuff, or do you mean no. copies of quantum states? Quantum states. Okay. Yeah. So this is probably a statement that you have read in many quantum machine learning papers, probably in the introduction. And we start from this point. Okay? So we kind, the community kind of agrees that this is a promising approach in the near term. So as we already discussed in many talks, at the end, the final goal is to use these parametrized quantum circuits to solve some real world data tasks, like protein folding, self-driving cars, or whatever. But we are not quite there yet, right? So instead of so the way we study these parametrized quantum circuits, then is like from a holistic perspective. We study expressivity, the trainability, and the generalization. So expressivity is related with what kind of functions can I approximate with my parametrized quantum circuit. Trainability is related to how hard will it be to find a reasonable, reasonable good hypothesis to solve my, my task. And then generalization is related to what's going to be the performance of, of my model with unseen new data. And all of them are important, but typically generalization is considered like the holy grail of machine learning, right? Because at the end, the whole point is to train your model with some limited data. And then you want the model to perform properly on new unseen data. And a clear example of why generalization is important is, for instance, self-driving cars. So you, you, want, you train your, your car in a safe environment to drive properly and not run over people, right? But at some point, you have to deploy this car into the real world, right? Into the streets of Los Angeles, for instance. And you don't want the car to run over people either, right? In the real world. So this is a clear example, a visceral example of why this is important. So good generalization would mean the car does not run over people. But generalization, you may have some trouble. <laughs> so let me give you a bit of historical context. So the hardcore maths of machine learning were mainly developed in the 70s by Babnik and others. And this is what we call the traditional learning theory. And throughout these years, this theory has been applied to the available models at the time, like kernel methods, uh, neural networks, and then later deep neural networks. But then suddenly, in 2016, a new paper appeared by DeepMind Group. 
and they were very clear about the conclusions of their work. They said, traditional learning theory cannot explain the success of deep learning. So we know that deep learning works, works really nice, but this traditional learning theory cannot explain its success. Okay? So since then, this was like kind of a revolution, and then new modern approaches were developed to study these uh, deep neural networks, in particular to study generalization. So now in parallel, we go to quantum machine learning, and in 2020, the first papers applying this traditional learning theory appeared, okay? which makes sense. And our work tries to like close this circle, and what we say is that traditional learning theory cannot explain the success of current small scale uh, quantum machine learning models. Yeah. So classically, did this succeed or they just don't care? It just works. <coughs> what? It's classically in 2016, did they succeed in understanding why things work or they just don't care? No, they okay, haven't so. succeeded yet. But at least they know that this traditional learning theory cannot explain that. Sorry, what, what is this last paper here? That's... This, this one is the one I'm presenting. Okay. Sorry. What do you mean by success of current? Okay, I, I will talk about this as well. <laughs> the reasonable success, let's say. Okay, I will, I will talk about this. <clears throat> okay, so this is kind of a fundamental statement if you ask me, but because we know that there's no successful uh, quantum machine learning or machine learning without good generalization. So the question is, are we studying it in the wrong way? This was kind of the elephant in the room. So we were aware of the results of this paper, of deep learning, but then we told ourselves, like, perhaps for a small scale quantum machine learning models, this traditional learning theory, so we, so we cannot get, get away with this traditional learning theory, okay? So as a closing a slide for the introduction, I've been talking about PQCs as quantum machine learning models, but the question is how well do these PQCs uh, generalize? And this perhaps answers the question, Maria's question. So there's this recent paper published in Nature Communications by Matthias Caro and some people at Los Alamos, where they basically say that PQCs actually can generalize wood. So they look at different scenarios, they derive some analytical results which are quite nice, but interestingly for us, they also run some numerical experiments. And they see that small quantum machine learning models can actually generalize surprisingly good for some particular task. So we can say that PQCs can generalize properly, but where does the theory fit here? Okay. So let's start with the pitch. So let me begin by uh, defining the problem. So I've been talking about machine learning, but let me focus on supervised machine learning. So in supervised machine learning, we are typically given a data distribution, D, where X is the input domain. So for instance, the images, right? 100 by 100 pixels, RGB. And Y are typically the labels, cats, dogs, but they can be also real numbers. And we assume that this data distribution is unknown but fixed. So what do I mean by unknown but fixed? So this data distribution, distribution could be me, for instance, taking pictures of cats and dogs and assigning the corresponding label. So what, what I mean by unknown is the fact that it would be very difficult to mathematically describe my behavior when taking these pictures of cats and dogs, right? So then we also have the model, which we call function family, also a hypothesis class, which is this capital F. This function family consists of a set of functions that, are, that depend on some parameter theta, theta that we can vary. Uh, to be clear, this is our parameterized quantum circuit with fixed architecture or a neural network. And then we want to evaluate the performance of these models. For this, we use the so-called population risk that depends on the whole distribution. Takes uh, an hypothesis of the, model, of the function family and outputs a real value. If this value is small, then it means that our model performs properly on the learning task. Okay. So we have our data distribution. We have the hypothesis class, and we want to obtain an hypothesis within the uh, hypothesis class that minimizes this population risk. So this is what we want. We want the population risk minimizer, a function that within the hypothesis class that minimizes the population risk. 
But in principle, this is something we cannot do because D is a known wizard, right? What we actually have is a training set. What we actually have is a training set of uh, size capital N, and we can compute a, a proxy for the performance. So instead of computing the population risk, we can compute the so-called empirical risk, which is R hat. Equivalently, equivalently to the uh, population risk, it also gives a real value. And again, if this is small, then it means that our model is performing properly on the training set. Okay. And what we can do is to find the empirical risk minimizer, which is the hypothesis within our hypothesis class that minimizes this empirical risk. Now the question is, but what's then the, the, the performance of this function f star on the population risk? Because this is what we were interested in, right? What's the, the performance on the entire distribution? And this typically is quantized by, this is like the big thing, this is quantized by the generalization gap which is defined as the difference between the empirical risk and the population risk. So this generation gap depends on the entire distribution and the training set. So I made a teeny tiny visualization for those people who are more visual. So we have our data distribution. We sample a training set of size n. We fit this into a learning algorithm that will look into the best hypothesis within the hypothesis class. And uh, so I will output this, this uh, hypothesis. But now the question is, but what's the performance of this hypothesis on the entire distribution? And this is what is quantized by this generalization gap, which is the difference between the empirical risk and the population risk. But then now, how in practice do we quantize this generalization gap? <clears throat> so this typically is done via is called generalization bounds, which are like mathematical theorems or guarantees on the magnitude of the generalization gap, which are color coded differently to avoid confusion. So this is the generalization bound, and this is the generalization gap. So this is the actual gap, and this is the bound. Okay? So in principle, this generalization bound could depend on many different things. Could depend on, the, on some structural properties of the function family, it could, for instance, how many parameters do I have in my network? This could depend on the shape of the loss landscape. It could depend on the optimization algorithm, whether I'm using a genetic algorithm or SGD. It could depend also on the properties of the data distribution. So, for instance, if my data distribution has high entanglement. And then, obviously, it will depend also on the number of training samples. So, you will have to believe me, but this is quite driving this sort of bounds is quite a difficult task, especially if you consider everything. This is mathematically intense, as people would say. Uh, so in practice, we always consider restricted cases. So is this just some version of agnostic learning, where you're just given samples from a distribution, and you want to fit a function to that distribution? Or is there something more going on? I'm not sure if I got your question. So is, it, is this just like agnostic learning, where you're given samples from a distribution, mm -hmm. you want to find a function in your hypothesis class that matches the distribution well in <coughs> That's it, yeah. Okay. Basically. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so let me present the results in a few words. So on one, on one hand, we have this experimental fact. So PQCs have reported to have a relatively small generation gap. <coughs> on the other hand, we have this theoretical fact, right? We have some generation bounds for PQCs. <coughs> so our question was, can really the theory explain the good generalization of parameterized quantum circuits? So can this generation bound, uh, bounds explain the generalization of parameterized quantum circuits? <coughs> and our answer is no, as we will see. <clears throat> so what do we mean precisely by this statement? So on the theory side, we have this so-called uniform generalization bounds, which I will define later. And on the experiments, we've seen that the generation gap can be small. So what we would say is that for the cases where the, this generation gap is small, every uniform generation bound is loose. Independently of how this uniform generation bound has been derived, it has to be loose. So it has to be large. This bound has to be large. So it, it 
does not provide information of the actual generalization gap. Excuse me. <coughs> I explain this, but when you say that the generalization gap is small, mm -hmm. usually this means as a scaling, right? As the prefactor, not an actual number. No, no in this. Yeah, in this case, I'm referring to an actual number. So we compute the difference. Don't many of these gaps have a big O in front? What? Don't many of these gaps have a big O in front and you get only No, but this o. is the bound. So not to confuse the bound with the gap. So the gap is something that you can compute. So you take the empirical risk and the difference with the... Usually you don't know it's up to factors, right? That's what I was... But the gap, like if you use testing data, you can evaluate <coughs> Yeah. You get a number. Yeah. yeah, you get a number four. And what I prove are bounds with prefactors okay. <laughs> that I don't know. Okay, okay. <clears throat> Quick question. Um, so what tasks do our PPCs... I will show later. <clears throat> so in a way, what we are saying is this thing here. So on the one hand, we've seen that the generation gap uh, can be small for certain tasks. I will show later. <laughs> and uh, on the other hand, what we're going to prove is that this uniform generalization bound is lower bounded by a large number. So there's a large difference between these two. This um, but this is true, like classic, like with neural networks and stuff as well, right? With these uniform bounds. Yeah, this is what the deep mind people prove. That the experiments do not match the theory. And I will show how we do this. <clears throat> So um, let me talk now about uh, uniform generation bounds. So OK, what are uniform generation bounds? So if we go a slides back, we said that in general, the generation bound could depend on many different things, like structural properties of the function family, shape of the loss landscape, optimization, number of training samples, and etc. So now let's get rid of most of the things, and let's fix ourselves in two of those. So only the structural, uh, structural properties of the function family and the number of training samples. So this is what we call uniform generation bound. So this will only depend on, depend on the structural properties of F and the number of training samples. So this may seem a bit constructive, but actually this is like the mainstream thing in, in the literature, right? So <coughs> these are some of the papers that derive some of these uniform generation bounds. And these are not on even half of them. So as we said, these uniform generation bounds uh, depend on uh, structural properties of F via something called complexity measure. Okay, so I will not like define this, but you can see this is some sort of the volume of function that you can approximate with, with your model. Okay, so it's closely related to the expressivity of the model. And some examples of these are the PC dimension, Rademacher complexity, and so on. And actually I will give an example of all this. And then it also depends on the number of training samples. So some examples of uh, structural properties that you can see in these papers, these are just a few, could be something like trivial as the number of gates <coughs> for real bloody models. This can be also the size of the Fourier spectrum, the number of trainable parameters, and also something more quantum as the amount of magic of your parameterized quantum circuit, uh, if you consider them channels. <coughs> So quick example for the BC dimension. So the BC dimension is the maximum number of data points that can be shattered by a model. So independently, this means shatter means that independently how I arrange the labels of my model, of the, of the uh, data points, my model would be able to fit them. So a quick example, a linear model, a simple line. If we consider three data points, so these are just three possible combinations. So it should be eight, but you, you get the point with this. If we consider only three uh, points, this linear model would be able to shatter them, right? Whereas if we consider four different points, then a linear model won't be able to, to shatter them. So this would mean that the, B, the BC dimension of this linear model is three. And this is actually what then you use to derive this gen, uh, uniform generation bounds. <clears throat> okay, so let's be more concrete about this uniform generation bounds. So we make the point that these bounds fit this template here. It's the theorem template. So let uh, x and y be the data space. This is something that uh, you fix. Let uh, f be the hypothesis family, r the population risk. 
the uh, C F of f, the complexity measure. And now, let d be any possible distribution. So this is something the theorem does not fix. And let be any possible training, uh, training uh, set of size n, sampled i, i, d from uh, the distribution. This is something you don't fix either. And r hat, the empirical risk. <coughs> then, the, the bound holds for any possible hypothesis in your hypothesis class, and in particular, the dependence is poly with the complexity measure uh, and one over the square root of n. Okay, so this is what the theorem says. This is what you fix, and you have freedom on the data distribution and the training uh, set. Okay. So this uniform, these bounds are uniform because they hold for any hypothesis, f, of your function family, and for any data distribution. This is important. And they are very popular because, I mean, these bounds come with a great promise, right? They can be useful to certificate that the hypothesis performs, for, performs well on data, on new data. They can be used as inspiration for the design of new models as well. And finally, on a deeper level, they can enable a more complete understanding of generalization in general. So let's do now a little thought experiment to see why uniform generalization bounds that cannot be or may not be a right approach to understand generalization. So imagine that we are given a data distribution d hat, which is a distribution for which learning is impossible. So how can this be? Imagine that now I'm d hat, I'm taking pictures of cats and dogs. What I do, I toss a coin and I randomly put the labels based on whether I, I see a tails or heads. So the labels of these pictures of dogs and cats are going to be basically random. So this means that the population risk is going to be large by construction because there's no correlation between the labels and the, and the pictures. Now imagine that we draw a training set of size n from this distribution. If we find an hypothesis on f, where the empirical risk is small, so that we manage to fit this training data from the corrupt uh, distribution, then the generation gap has to be large, right? Because we have said that this is large by construction and this is small. Then with this, we show that uniform generation bounds will also be large, okay? So this is like the main uh, idea. <clears throat> so simplified message that I will be reiterating during the talk, if hypothesis class can fit a corrupt training set, then uniform generalization bounds are large for that class. So now let me show you how <coughs> we randomize this uh, data. So I went online. <coughs> let me start with a classical, uh, yeah. About this last point that you made, uh, this is something I never understood about the classical paper, because you, you have like two uniformities, right? You have the uniformity over the distributions and over the class. Say it again. It's uniform over all functions in the class, uh -huh. and it's uniform over all possible data distributions. Yeah. Do you have a feeling of like, do you need both? Like, are both uniformities the problem? Or is the yeah, problem that, uniformity over the distribution? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. And I, I think I remember I read something about this, and I think as long as one of them is like uniform, this should apply. But now I'm not sure, right? Because here we are considering both cases. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the uniformity over all distributions, mm -hmm. that definitely seems necessary. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, your bound maybe just yeah. doesn't apply to the corrupt distribution. Exactly. That's necessary. The other one, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, me neither. Uh, I would need to think about it. But yeah, for sure, the distribution, yeah. Uniformity over the distribution, for sure. <clears throat> so let me start with a classical example to, to be clearer. So I went online and I took some images of dogs and cats from the Cipher 10 dataset. So a well-posed machine learning problem uh, task here would be to classify these images on their corresponding uh, label, cats and dogs. So what we could start doing to randomize this distribution, we could partially corrupt the labels. So we could, with certain probability, flip a seven-sided coin and assign randomly uh, the labels of some of the images. So in red, you see the mislaid uh, 
the images with uh, incorrect label, and in green you see the images with the correct label. So this might be interesting to see whether the neural network can fit the random data, while at the same time fits the real uh, the real uh, images. <clears throat> now we can take this to the extreme and randomize every label. So in this case, we always flip our seven-sided uh, seven coin. And of course, some of them may end up in the correct label by chance. So <clears throat> in this case, there's no near network that can learn this distribution, right? Because it's totally random. The labels are completely uncorrelated with the images. Now what we can do also is, instead of randomizing the labels, we can randomize the input images. So in particular, in the paper of uh, DeepMind, they take every image, they compute the average of the pixels and the variance, and then they sample new images from a Gaussian distribution with the same mean and variance. So this is how they do it. So with this picture in mind, we are going to use the same idea, but using quantum data instead of images of dogs and cats and labels of cats and dogs. Okay? So this is the whole uh, framework we work with. So there are quite a lot of things here. So let me unpack everything step by step. So there are two boxes, the empirical experiments and the uniform generalization bounds. <clears throat> so let's focus now on the top box. We are originally uh, given some data distribution D. We sample a training set, which contains quantum states and the corresponding labels. And we feed this into our training algorithm. <clears throat> and uh, this training algorithm will look for some hypothesis that fits nicely the training set. So ideally, this training error will be small. <clears throat> now, we go again to this data distribution and we sample a larger test set. And we see what's the performance of this hypothesis on the large test set. And let's see, so ima let's imagine that this test error is also small. Okay, so this would mean that the generation gap is small, right? Because the difference between two small things is small. Now let's randomize this data distribution. And let's sample, again, quantum states with these random labels. We are going to fit this into our training algorithm. We are, do, we are going to do the same. And let's imagine that the training algorithm outputs as well a function, f corrupted, that fits nicely the training data, so that the training error is a small. Now we go to the randomized data distribution again. We sample a large test set. And here, by construction, the test error has to be large. Because there's no correlation between labels and quantum states. So the test error has to be large for any hypothesis. So if we compute the generation gap, the generation gap has to be large. So notice here that we have not changed anything uh, in these two cases. We only have changed the data distribution. So the size of the training set is the same. The training algorithm is the same. Everything is the same except the data distributions. And this is important. So now we go to the quantum machine learning literature and we look at what uniform generalization bounds say. And these bounds say that for any hypothesis in my hypothesis class, the generalization gap has to be upper bounded by some value. But at the same time, we have found that this generation gap is quite large. So Basically, we are saying that the generation bound is going to be lower, lower bounded by a large value, and therefore proving that the generation bound contains no information about the actual generalization of the model. Okay? So this is like the whole framework. I guess this also answers my question from before, because now the for all functions in your class. Yeah, so, so yeah, you, for this test, then one would need to also assume uniformity on the functions, yeah. So, simplified message. <clears throat> Again, if hypothesis class can fit corrupt training sets, then this means that uniform generation bounds are large for that class. And here, there's a little disclaimer, because what I want to mention is that this randomization test cannot work for arbitrarily large training sets. Because at some point, if we keep growing the training uh, set, the training error of F corrupted is going to be very large, right? Because if we fix the capacity of our network and we keep growing the size of the training set, 
the network is gonna, not going to be able to fit like the whole training set. So eventually, the generation gap is going to be small, which is in agreement with the theorems. So this mini explanation is just to say that the theorems are not wrong. Simply that it happens that for uh, realistic practical scenarios, <clears throat> this uh, bound might be uh, too, too loose. Sorry. So just understand, so the second thing you're saying is if you let n go very large, yeah. you're not going to see the effect. But yeah. you could still have a bad bound, right? In the sense that it's, the error is still much smaller for every it could n, be, but for you, every n, right? Yeah, but you, you, can, you cannot like, prove it. No, but this I, would exp this I would then call a failure of the, of, the, of the bound, right? But how would you prove that the bound is loose? Ah, yeah. Yeah, this may happen, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> okay, so I've been talking uh, quite abstract about the learning task and the learning model. So in our numerical experiments, the task that we are going to consider is the quantum phase recognition, and the model is the quantum convolutional neural network. So to be precise, the learning task is going to be classify classifying ground states of the generalized cluster Hamiltonian according to their phase. So this is the generalized cluster Hamiltonian. It has one, two, three body terms and some coupling coefficients, J1 and J2. And then depending on these coupling coefficients, the ground state will pertain on a different uh, phase. Okay? This is the diagram. <coughs> so there are four different phases depending on these values. The first one is the symmetry protected topological phase. Second one is the ferromagnetic phase, the third one is the anti-ferromagnetic phase, and the fourth one is the so-called trivial phase. So uh, let me mention that we are going to sample from this diagram uh, at random. So for the uh, model that we are going to use is the quantum convolutional neural network, which was proposed by Iris Kong in uh, Lukin's group. Uh, so this model tries to imitate the classical convolutional neural network here. So it consists of also uh, convolutional layers, which are uh, two qubit gates in neighboring qubits uh, sh with parameter sharing and are translational invariant. And then you typically apply the so-called pooling layer, where what you do is measure a constant number of qubits to reduce the dimensionality of the problem. And then you repeat this process until you, meet, uh, you uh, measure a small number of qubits. So this Network is very popular, I guess, specifically because it has been shown that it exhibits no barren plateaus. <clears throat> so for our numerical experiments, we are going to corrupt the data distribution, and then we are going to train. Again, if the training error is small, then uniform generation bounds are large. We are going to do this for real data, random labels, and random states. And then Separately, we are also going to study these partially corrupted labels and everything under, under this framework here. So these are the results of the first experiments. Here we are considering random labels, random states, and real data. And we are going to average over different number of qubits, 8, 16, and 32. So what I'm, going, what I'm showing here is the generation gap as a function of the training set size. So for the real data, you can see the, like the common behavior. As you increase the number of training data, then the generation gap decreases. But for the uh, random uh, labels and random states, we observe a different behavior. So <clears throat> for less than 10 training data, we observe that the generation gap is as big as it could be. Right? So for the random labels, this is 0 0.75 random case, uh, guessing of balanced, balanced classes. And for the random states, this is 0 0.6, because the, here we left untouched the, <coughs> the labels, and some regions are bigger than others. So we have some sort of unbiased random, guess, uh, biased random guessing. But then, as we keep increasing the uh, size of our training set, since the capacity of our quantum convolutional neural network is fixed, then you cannot fit like the whole entire uh, training set, and therefore the generation gap slowly decreases. Okay? So the main message of these uh, results is that quantum completion and neural networks can fit 
random distributions. <clears throat> then we go to our, our, our other experiment about uh, partially corrupt data. So these experiments, we consider eight number of qubits. And also, here, the training error is going to be always zero. So this means that the test error is basically the gener generalization gap. Okay. So here, I'm plotting the test error as a function of the label corruption. So zero level corruption would mean real data. And one level corruption would mean that every all the labels are, are randomized. So you can see that for the case of real labels, the larger n, so this is the uh, training data size, 4, 6, 8. The larger the n, the smaller is the test error. So with already uh, only 8 training data points, we managed to get almost 0 0.1 of training error, of test error, sorry. <clears throat> so pretty good generalization. Then as we keep increasing, the label corruption, we see some sort of interpolation between this case here, the random guessing. It's like continuous. So this basically means that the quantum convolutional neural network manages to fit the noise in the data, while at the same time manages to retrieve like the signal as well, which is great. So here at the inset, uh, I'm showing the training error as a function of the training time for different label corruptions, 0, 1 third, 2 thirds, and 1. And as we can see, uh, the training error, the training time seems to be unaffected uh, independently of the corruption, the corruption of our labels. So the main message is that quantum convolutional neural networks can fit noise and fit as well the remaining signal. <clears throat> so simplified message again. If a, if a hypothesis class can fit corrupt training sets, then uniform generation bounds are large for that, for that class. And this is precisely what we see in our experiments. We see that uh, the quantum convolutional neural network can fit random labels to quantum states, can fit labels to random quantum states, and can fit partially corrupted labels to quantum states. So the conclusion is that all uniform generation bounds, independently of how you derive this uniform bound, are large for the class of existing quantum machine learning models, in particular, the quantum convolutional neural network. So let me uh, finalize with this section about memorization, where we try to derive some analytical results, which pair nicely with our numerical experiments. So again, and for last time, the simplified message. If a hypothesis class can fit corrupt training sets, then uniform generation bounds are large for that class. And let me put a simple follow-up on this. If a hypothesis class can fit any label set, then, in particular, it can also fit corrupt uh, training sets. So this is in line with what we call memorization, which is the ability or capability of a model to fit any label set. But in particular, in machine learning, we always deal with finite sets, right? And this goes in line with the, what we call finite sample expressivity, which is the ability to fit any labeled uh, set of fixed size. So we try to prove some analytical results on this finite sample expressivity. And this is our first theorem in the paper, which is related to the finite sample expressivity of quantum circuits, not parametrized quantum circuits. <clears throat> so this theorem says that given uh, some uh, unknown quantum states, n of them, on n qubits, then for any assignment, for any number of real labels, from 1 to n, we can construct a quantum circuit of depth poly as an observable NY, such that we can assign the correct label <coughs> to the quantum state. Okay? So we are saying somehow, in some sense, that quantum circuits are universal. This is not surprising. But the problem is that these quantum circuits do not resemble parametrized quantum circuits. So we had to impose like additional restrictions to prove this theorem for parametrized quantum circuits. This is the informal definition. Now, let, let rho 1 to rho n <coughs> unknown quantum states on n qubits and let's assume we have a reasonable amount of them, and fulfilling some distinguishability condition, which I will not enter in the details, but this is the extra imposed restrictions, then we can construct a parametrized quantum circuit of this, of depth poly n as a parametrized observable m theta, such that for any arrangement of the labels, we can find the parameters theta y fulfilling this thing, so we can assign the correct labels. So, this is great, but we had to include some additional restrictions for the param uh, 
parameterized quantum circuits. So, why? Because it's poly depth limited, or what? Uh, the issue is that so we wanted to implement everything as a PQC. For this, we needed some extra conditions on the input quantum states. But, I mean, but previously, you had for a, you, you constructed an arbitrary circuit, but PQCs are you know universal if you construct them in the right way. So, what's, what's the catch? So the catch is that here, so here we are using uh, oracles and we are using like a um, swap-like quantum circuits. And we wanted to get rid of this. So we wanted to implement everything as a PQC. And to do this, we have to impose some restrictions on these initial quantum states, in particular, that you can officially construct them as a quantum circuit. I do understand what I don't understand is that PQCs are universal, right? So they should be able to mimic whatever circuits you get in the... If, yeah, exactly. if they're deep enough, express enough, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but if I remember correctly, I would need to check again the appendix. Here we need to call several times the, the input states. And this is something we, don't, we want to get right in the parameterized quantum circuit. So this is perhaps something we can discuss later as well. OK, so in our numerical experiments, we've run uh, uh, some uh, experiments experiments up to 32 qubits, right? But 32 qubits is not like 1 million qubits. So with the analytical results, we want to show that there's like a clear you know, way, <coughs> uh, like a clear understanding of how this parameterized quantum circuit could actually also uh, uh, fit arbitrary size training sets, right? So our, we wanted to, see, to show that our empirical and FIDIX could extend to models of arbitrary size beyond our experiments with these analytical results. So let me finalize with the conclusion. So we have shown this is like the main message that uniform generation bounds cannot explain the good generation performance of existing quantum machine learning models, in particular the quantum convolutional neural networks. But we also make the point that probably these results go beyond quantum convolutional neural networks because Quantum convolutional neural networks are very restricted ANSAT with this parameter sharing, logarithmic depth, and measurement. So probably less restricted ANSAT would also <coughs> memorize uh, random data. Also another interesting thing that we observe is that the training seems to be unaffected by the data corruption. So now the question is, okay, well then what's next, right? And the common sense answer would be, well, let's study non-uniform generation bounds. So I see like two possible paths here. The first one would be to simply follow the deep learning literature. On the analytical side, study, for, for instance, recent developments in information theoretic generation bounds or packed Bayesian generation bounds. Or on the numerical side, let's try to see whether there's some sort of correlation with the time to convergence, the sharpness of the minimum, the resilience to noise in the data with the generalization of the model. And then, on the other hand, so we have these classical tools, we have this classical hammer trying to hit the quantum nail. So the question is, can we create some sort of quantum hammer to hit this quantum nail? So can we find any genuinely quantum complexity measure? And this is actually very easy to say, but I have no idea how this would ever look like. I'm just throwing it here in case, in case anyone has any possible idea. <clears throat> so with this, uh, I finalize. Thank you very much for your attention.